The Sunset Strip Diaries, Chapter 2, The Choice. Eighth grade was no joy, but it was better than seventh grade. I was full of angst. Just thinking about it actually makes me want to take some Valium. I was back to staying in my room with the door closed, and all I really did was write in my diary and daydream about boys. I guess that is pretty typical. I read Wuthering Heights for a book report and got totally obsessed with it. I was suddenly writing in my diary as if I was on the moors with Heathcliff. I wanted romance. I wanted to be in love. I was writing things like, if all else perished and he remained, I should continue to be. I was completely boy crazy. The difference between my boy craziness and other girls my age was that they were boy crazy white talking to actual boys at the Galleria or Skateland in the Valley. I was boy crazy behind the closed doors of my room and I wanted to shout from the rooftops and wear flowing gowns on mountainsides while being boy crazy. Why am I saying why instead of while? Sorry about that, guys. Continuing on. For the first half of the school year, I was still pretty innocent as far as my thoughts and interests were concerned. I became really interested in old film stars like Rita Hayworth, Barbara Stanwyck, Marilyn Monroe, and Natalie Wood. I hung up their black and white pictures and I wished I could do my hair and my makeup just like theirs. They were so glamorous in sparkling gowns, shiny hair styled in waves and long eyelashes. My mom got me a big fat Warner Brothers Studios coffee table book for Valentine's Day that year. She saw me fawning over it at a bookstore and decided to get it for me, along with a jar of peppermint candies. I loved the book and what it held. It was pictures of a different time. I felt homesick for it. I had recently watched Meet Me in St. Louis and Little Women, and they made me long to be in another decade. I felt pain in my heart at the voices of the actors and the actresses, the attire, the sets, the songs. Things like love and family seemed sweetly simple, yet things like decor and manners were more formal. While watching those old 1940s movies, I felt more at home than I did in my own family. When times were bad, I used those old films and pictures to bring me security. I really started piling on the makeup even more that year. I felt relief each time I applied another layer to my face. It was a literal mask I hid behind. I felt braver with it. When I took it off at home, I felt very vulnerable. I started wearing tons of foundation in the wrong shade, tons of dark, loose powder from a pink plastic container, both hand-me-downs from my Aunt Billy, along with loads of blue eyeliner that winged out at the sides. I reapplied it all after each class, and sometimes during class. One of the more outspoken ninth graders looked at me one day and said, Dude, you're going to drown yourself in foundation. I always had tons of makeup on the collars of my shirts and jackets. I looked like a broken down teenage Joan Collins. Like most teenagers, I was curious about sex. I was too frightened to ask my parents how it worked. I wasn't sure how my mother would react, and I knew I did not want to ask her. My dad wasn't as pervy toward me that year. Maybe it was because I was no longer 12. Nevertheless, I did not want to rehash his feelings by asking him about the facts of life. That would be a stupid move. I didn't have any friends to ask. Karen was still hanging up posters of kittens, so I took my cues from music and TV. I liked a new group called the Beastie Boys. I thought Ad Rock was cute. I didn't know then that anyone looks cute next to Mike D and MCA, but that's neither here nor there. I listened to my license to ill tape, rewinding it repeatedly to try and decipher the lyrics to get some sort of clue as to what people did behind closed doors. They were risque and they talked about having sex with girls, although I could barely decode what they were talking about. Between their thick Brooklyn and Queens accents and their slang, it didn't make much sense to me. A wiffle ball bat? Forty deuce, turntables, white castle. I really could not have picked worse teachers. I started actively searching for meaning and other songs on the radio by groups like Def Leppard, Rat, and of course Madonna. Most of the music I was listening to was from the viewpoint of a man, and what I learned from it all was that men desired women and wanted to do stuff with them. I just couldn't figure out exact directions.
I remember many Genesis songs, songs from Janet Jackson's Control album, and songs from Bon Jovi's Slippery When Wet album. Despite the racy album name, Bon Jovi really wasn't too bad. They were kind of like long-haired Bruce Springsteens. They were from New Jersey, and they sung about the prom, and waitresses, and steelworkers being broke, blue-collared, anthem type of songs. I liked hearing the songs through the wall when my sister played them. She always found hip music before I did. There was a new glam rock band out at that time called Poison. They really caught my eye. They had a catchy song called Talk Dirty to Me. They always appeared to be in the dead center of a huge party. Their videos were a mess of electric green, hot pink, red, baby blue, and leopard skin. They wore lipstick, they had long hair, sprayed with what looked like tons of Aquanet. They were always checking out chicks walking by and humping the microphone stand and gyrating, flicking a tongue between two fingers. They were still guys. It was really confusing, yet exciting. The beauty of women, yet the sexuality of men. A perfect combination, if I ever saw one. I was intrigued. I lost interest in Mark Paletti that year because I saw that there was some fresh meat in the grade below me. There was one boy in particular who I found super cute named Zach. He was in my English class and kept turning around in his chair and checking me out. I didn't know what to do. I panicked and pretended it wasn't happening. He was a tall kid with dark blonde hair that looked wet with gel, big wide set blue eyes and some freckles. He tried getting my attention for a few weeks and I just could not bring myself to look back at him or show any, any interest in him, even though I found him totally cute. I fantasized about Jack and was flattered he liked me. I never dreamed another girl would swoop in and take him away. I became friends with popular Kelly Fiorella that year. She was a talkative social girl who dated all the boys and somehow remained a good girl. She found Zach attractive and she wanted to date him. It took all of two days for them to become a couple. She had another girl go up to him and ask him what he thought of her, which was apparently the way to get someone to go out with you in junior high. And the word was out that she was interested. And the next thing I knew, they were boyfriend-girlfriend. I was crushed. I wanted to cry tears of navy blue eyeliner. I really could not believe he went for it. Well, he was no dummy. He was like, where do I sign up? I fantasized that he would tell her in a very dramatic Days of Our Lives tone, no, my heart is with someone else. But he never did. I was mean to Kelly, and I didn't want to hear her lispy, lovesick ramblings. She asked me to sit with them at lunch. Both Zach and I were uncomfortable. I wondered, though, what do they talk about? How did it go? How did one have a boyfriend at 13? We couldn't drive. How was it done? Did you have to do more than kiss? I, I felt really behind. What if something embarrassing happened between the boy and me? It was such a small school. Would I have to see the boy every day? What if he laughed in my face because I didn't know what to do with him? Everybody would know about it. I, I just couldn't do it. I set my sights on another boy named Eric. He was a troublemaker who was always in the principal's office. And now that I look back, he really was not cute. He was sort of scrawny and he had squinty eyes. Anyway, we were supposed to do some performance for the school, and he chose me as a partner. We were supposed to represent the 1960s and do the twist. I made sure I was absent that day because there was no way I was getting on the Middleton stage and doing some lame-ass dance. But that was all insignificant as far as I was concerned because a real live boy had requested me as his partner. Suddenly I was in love. I wrote about Eric in my diary, filling it up with flowery prose. I think I filled two or three diaries with nothing but Eric, 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 cuckoo. Then I started to become seriously psycho. I started crying over him in my room, listening to love songs and lighting candles. The Jets, you got it all, would make me sprout tears. And Bon Jovi's never say goodbye, oh my gosh, would make me do the ugly cry face and want to stab myself in the heart. I thought of nothing but squinty-eyed Eric, and every day I would put on my makeup and do my hair thinking of him, hoping to run into him. He never even spoke to me. I never even had a conversation with this boy. I just stared at him, trying to lock eyes with him, and at first he looked back, and then he started to realize I was nuts, and he would not meet my gaze. He was probably thinking, I'm never going to request a dance partner again for the rest of my life. 
My sister tried to comment on my obsession, and I yelled at her, You don't know what love is! Through tears and snot, as she looked at me with a raised eyebrow. I was a giant heaving bowl of crazy with sprinkles on top. I still liked the blonde boy, Zack, and to my dismay, he became best friends with Eric. And once that happened, they both avoided me completely. They even started to make fun of me. And I remember one day hearing them snicker after I walked by in my one-inch Payless pumps with socks, wearing my mom's ill-fitting black and white checkered shirt, a long white skirt, and my clown makeup. And another time I was walking up the stairs in front of them and the sole of my shoe fell off. I had to pick up the sole and put it in my book bag. I was so embarrassed. There was a hole punched in the wall by my bedroom around that time. We found out that my mother had done it, but we were not allowed to talk about it. My parents were acting odd and secretive. A few days later, I was told I was to move out of my bedroom. It was the first room before a long hallway separated from the rest of the house. I was being moved to a room down by my parents' room and my sister's room. While my room was in transition, a big cockroach fell from the ceiling and hit a book on my bed. I wondered if there was some sort of evil marking that room. It was bizarre. Things felt out of control in my home life, so I started to discipline myself very strictly in private. I studied French in my room. I tried to memorize Bible verses, lines of Shakespeare. I decided I needed to sing the national anthem each day while doing a backbend. I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but it was part of a ritual. And in hindsight, I guess it made me feel like I could control something. And in addition to all of these other secretive, weird, bullshit things going on in my family, there was another development taking place. I was breaking away and developing an identity of my own. I mean, I was a teenager. That's what teenagers do. My father had a hard time accepting it. And as soon as I started to develop interests and tastes that were completely different from his, he became very insulted. He saw he was no longer my hero. I did not look up to him. I did not value what he valued. I think it hurt his feelings. Maybe that is what he used as a justification to hurt me the way he did. I don't know. My father did not value typical American commercial success. He had more of an alternative view of things. He was a former hippie, first off. My mother and he had run off to live in the hippie communes in the early 70s before I was born. They literally lived in a cave, naked, and it is worth noting for the sheer sensationalism of it that they ran into Charles Manson and company while they were hitchhiking around LA. So as you can imagine, my dad thought corporate America was the devil. He did not own a suit. He did not see a need for a higher education. It was not something he told us was of any importance. He didn't trust the government. He did not like rules. And just like my mother, he avoided anyone with money. It made him very uncomfortable. And it was made clear to me that rich people were the bad guys. My dad loved the desert, the sand, and being outdoors around nature. He loved playing the guitar and singing and having long philosophical talks with people around a fire or playing chess. And none of that was bad. It just wasn't what his teenage daughter liked. I was not impressed with him like so many others were. I did value commercial success. I wanted refinement, glamour, and culture. I was interested in advertising, journalism, literature, filmmaking, all of the performing arts. I loved learning. I craved discipline. I was interested in traveling to other countries. I wanted to run a real business one day. I always had files, briefcases, business cards, and drawn up plans of my future houses and business ventures. And the more that my father saw who I wanted to be, the more he did not like what he saw. I wanted to live in a Victorian mansion with damask wallpaper and go to the ballet and shit. I wanted to run an empire by day and recline on an antique settee in the evenings, reading stacks of books from my library. I wanted to become something grand, which is the very type of person who threatened my parents. My dad made snide comments about my likes and taste quite often. He looked at my framed pictures of Natalie Wood and told me she was dead and full of worms. He taunted me about my wanting to live in London, saying I wouldn't make it there because they didn't have my favorite breakfast cereal. I would have to eat what they had. Just little jabs like that. He just picked on me. One day I was watching some great 80s programming, a fine, highly acclaimed culture rich show that rivaled the Masterpiece Theater. Different strokes. Kimberly Drummond, the rich, waspy daughter, had this fabulous bikini figure, and everyone was praising her. Then it was revealed that she had something called bulimia. She binged on food at night, 
I will never forget her scooping peanut butter from the jar with her fingers, and then she proceeded to force herself to vomit in the toilet, as per the sound effects of the closed bathroom door. It made her look great. She got to eat like a pig, and she had an official problem. She eventually got tons of attention and an intervention by her loving family, who were cursing themselves for not seeing the signs. Oh, that was it. I would get a problem. I would become bulimic. You were thinking, who is that stupid? Well, me. I was that lame. I started throwing up my food at home. Fingers down the throat, touching the little punching bag. Everything came up. I tasted it all over again. And if I didn't drink enough water with my meal, it all got stuck in my throat and I thought I would choke to death. My eyes watered, my nose ran. I never did it at school because I only did it near my parents. And at first it was kind of a novelty. I thought, can I do this? Then I started doing it all the time, hoping my parents would catch on. They didn't. I became dangerously bulimic at the end of eighth grade. My sister was very upset by it and begged me to stop. I puked up everything. Most of all, fried bologna sandwiches with jack cheese and mustard, if you must know. I started to throw up without even using my finger. I just leaned over and heaved. My parents did not ex did not notice my extreme weight loss. They didn't pick up on my immediately leaving after eating, going to the bathroom, retching, and then coming back wiping my mouth. They didn't notice the sour smell of vomit anywhere. I mean, it got worse and worse, and I thought, help! Somebody come to my rescue! I want attention! I mean, I lost a lot of weight that summer. Weight loss wasn't the reason I really started throwing up my food, but I was happy with my new figure nonetheless. I thought, whoa, this shit works. Not just boys, but men started really checking me out. I started to like the attention. I fantasized about dressing sexier, but I was scared. I spent time in my room in large white men-sized t-shirts, pulling them tight around my figure to see what I would look like in a tight dress and I twisted them and tied them in a knot right under my chest. And I started cutting my long skirts into short skirts, skirts that I got for Christmas, once all the way to my ankles, were now just past my behind. Things slowly became shorter and shorter. I started doing bust exercises and sit-ups every night like a maniac. I did calf lifts. I laid in the sun a lot. And now that I was starting to look more attractive, I wanted to do exciting and daring things. I could not waste my looks sitting around watching Charles in charge and picking my ass. I needed to break up people's relationships. I needed to steal boyfriends, have evil plans, and gaze up at people through smoky eyeshadow. I also dreamed of being able to say gutsy lines, flip my hair in slow motion. I watched nighttime soap shows like Dynasty and the Colbys, and initially it was just so I could go back to school and join the conversation with Mark Poletti. He watched Dynasty and always turned around and discussed it with the people behind him in class. I initially sat and listened as they talked about the show, then I secretly began watching it so I could interject with something interesting. I think when I finally did, it backfired on me because I tried too hard. I brought up Dynasty so much, Mark started getting irritated and stopped talking about it. Eventually, he made some comment about not even liking the show anymore. It was most definitely so I was shut up. At any rate, I watched the shows and I took note of two things. One, the glamour. The wardrobes consisted of jewels, gowns, furs, large hats. There was overly styled hair and an ocean of makeup. The more evil the woman, the more makeup she wore. Two, the balls. No, not a ball like this, the one Cinderella attended, but balls as in testicles. The women had balls. They said vicious things to each other and managed to look cool while doing so. They told someone off or slapped someone in the face and had a great exit where they turned and walked away effortlessly. I can't say that word, guys. I'm sorry. Effortlessly. No tripping on a pebble. No feeling nervous or regretting anything. And of course, they had a very glossy lip and a beautifully blended eye and shadow in shades of peacock. I cared not for the designer gowns because I knew nothing of designers. And if I did, I probably would not have been into Nolan Miller, best believe. I did not know anything about jewels. I thought rhinestones were the shit. It was the confidence of these women that I wanted to emulate. I was a damned fool for taking nighttime soaps so literally, but I wanted to be like these women. I wanted to be brave, daring, and beautiful. These were my role models. If the women on Dynasty were interested in a man, well, they seduced him. 
I paid close attention to that move because it was ultra ballsy and it looked so scary to do in real life. I mean, could I seduce one of the Middleton boys? I started to think about who would be my ideal boy to seduce. And it wasn't really anyone at Middleton. It was Jeff Hunter, the super cute heavy metal boy in my fifth and sixth grade classes at Tadley, who let Tiffany Nixon sit in his lap. I daydreamed of walking up to his door with my new look and improved figure. He lived only a few houses down and around the corner. I imagined his rocker eyeballs popping out of his head, him grabbing me and making out with me. And I wished I could make myself go over there, but I knew I would be too scared to even try and I kept it as a daydream. In the back of my mind, heavy metal was where it was at. These Middleton kids, they were good goodies, wearing collared shirts with Reeboks, watching Moonlighting. Ninth grade was coming up, and that was going to be my last chance to be cool at Middleton. My last chance to avoid going down in history as a loser, wearing my dad's sweaters from Jemco. There would be no one in the grade above me to scare me or make fun of me if I wanted to try a new look in ninth grade. Even Eric and Zach were both going to change schools and would not be there in the fall. I started to get really into a heavy metal band called Rat after seeing the music video to their song, Dance. I thought the singer Stephen Piercy was hot. He wore all white and had a black headband around his head like he was going to work out with Olivia Newton-John. He had a scratchy voice that hooked me. I saved my allowance and bought their record, Dancing Undercover. I played it over and over until I memorized the entire thing. Then I saw another heavy midi, heavy midi, heavy metal video that inspired me. White Snakes, here I go again. There was a flashy redhead in the video who flipped her long, messy hair back without fear. She was lifting herself out of a car window while her old, decrepit boyfriend drove through a tunnel, looking like he was thinking about his mortgage or what he should eat later. She was rolling around on jaguars and white flowing clothes, appearing super confident. Wow. I wanted to be like that. I was starved for attention. My main goal in life suddenly became doing a forward walkover on a Jaguar XJ without making dents in the hood. I was figuring out what kind of person I wanted to be, what kind of image I wanted to portray. As a kid, I thought for sure I would at least be the CEO of something. I thought I'd be walking around with a briefcase or sitting in a huge office or running the world or at least paramount. But as soon as I hit puberty, I found myself lacking the confidence to make any of my dreams happen. I almost felt like a fool. Looking around, I saw that women did not run businesses. Some did, of course, but I didn't know that. They were supposed to be pretty, sexy, thin, and more or less subservient. They were supposed to be in the background, unless they were a sex object, in which case they were openly ogled. The women who were really sexy were the only ones who had any power over anybody. Guys fell down to their feet, drooling and hitting themselves on the head with a cartoon hammer. The nice, unsexy women were secretaries, teachers, housewives, wallflowers. I look back and I realize that part of the sadness and depression I felt as a teenager was the mourning of my old self. I knew I gave up on everything I ever wanted to do. I was so disappointed in myself. I knew I lost my spark and my drive. I quietly buried it all and just drowned myself in makeup and turned up my records. It was a waste. Where did I get the message that I couldn't be something other than pretty, sexy, and thin? Well, there's the obvious. Music videos, movies, TV, every piece of popular media to which I had access. It was 1987 by that time. The images and messages I grew up with were at an all-time high in sexism. I mean, I think back and then the only chance I probably would have had is if the movie Working Girl would have come out a year earlier. I wasn't exposed to any other message for girls other than you had to be sexy or you'd be ignored, considered boring, and be doomed to a life in the background. Screw that. I was not going out like that. I also picked up on how my father talked about women and the things he saw as important in a woman. He was probably no different than any other man during those years, but this is what I noticed. Women had to be thin. That was most important. Whenever my father described a woman, he first mentioned whether she was heavy or not. It was never as if, never about whether she was a good person or any value she had. It was always her weight. 
It also didn't help that he had tried to talk me down from my ambitions, sometimes resorting to mockery. And the other stronger message my father gave me was that I was desired in some way. It's disgusting. I honestly remember thinking more or less, oh, okay, this is my value. I get it. This is what I bring to the table. This is my angle. I was intelligent enough to know that it wasn't fair and it wasn't right. But that seemed beside the point. I remember thinking it really didn't matter whether or not I agreed. Things were going to go on as they were, and I needed to work with it. I had to adapt. I wasn't confident enough or mature enough to take a stand and try to change things. I was determined to play the game. And believe me, I was not in tears thinking of having to play the freaking game. I was excited. I was like, yay, I'm going to do something bad. My parents were paying very little attention to me, so it was the perfect time to try something risky. I decided that my new look would be a heavy metal chick. It was not nerdy, it was cool, and I would make myself into Jeff Hunter's dream girl. I figured I could probably pull off the look because it did not require a bunch of expensive clothing. The rock look was just black concert t-shirts, short skirts, and high heels. And I had most of that in my closet already. The problem with me was that I saw everything in black and white. I was very extreme. When I set my mind to be cool, I was going to be cool no matter what it took. If something didn't feel right to me, I wouldn't stop and reevaluate. I would barrel right past the feeling and push myself to follow through with the plan. I didn't consider that there were many subcultures of cool and uncool. I just knew that there was good, which was boring, nerdy, and wallflower and there was bad. Sexy, pretty, and cool. I chose bad. <laughs>